Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Carol Becker. I'm Dean of the School of the Arts at Columbia University, and I'm also a writer. And um, of course, this is Oliver Lyson, who is, um, I, I don't want him to watch me while I say this, because he's quite modest, but I think truly one of the most interesting artists working today. And I say that um, he's Danish, Icelandic, he uh, lives in Copenhagen, he works in Berlin. He has a complex life, but he also is a very uh, complex and conceptual thinker. And he's an artist, of course. He's a fantastic thinker, and he approaches problems as a philosopher, and as a poet, and as a designer, and as an architect, and as an innovator, and of course, um, as a social entrepreneur. And um, I think it's probably what it takes to be an artist now in the 21st century, that one to deal with the world as it is and the complexity of the questions that uh, the world has posed to us and that we've posed to the world. I think you need all those facilities to make important work. And he surely has made important work. Um, because he is one of the uh, Crystal Awardees this year and because his project um, the Little Sun is probably the main reason, his, enti his entire body of work, but also The Little Sun is the main reason for the award this year. Um, we're going to start with talking about The Little Sun. So I, I think we have an image. There it is. Oh, nope. uh-oh. Where's Little Sun? There's Little Sun. Okay. So, uh, Oliver, I, I think that you should um, maybe give people some understanding of how you evolve the concept of The Little Sun, and I know that the initial idea, because I've read you speaking about this in interviews, um, was some real poetic desire to capture light and to be able to move light from one place to another. And you worked closely with a light engineer to actualize it. So can you talk a little bit about the impetus for it and the process of creating it? Yes, absolutely, Carolyn. Thank you for this quite ambitious introduction. Um, I'm in such good company with you, Carolyn. <laughs> see, see uh, the little town started um, really in collaboration with a scientist, a uh, scientist, an engineer who then was became a solar obsessed engineer. And um, as we know that solar panels got better and better, batteries got better and better and cheaper and cheaper, solar panels got cheaper and cheaper, LEDs got better and better and cheaper and cheaper. So a lot of sort of curves in the head of this scientist, Frederik, who's, I think, here. Um, Frederik, can you put your hand up? Oh, right there. Oh, that's why I don't see you. See, no, so, so, and Frederik and I spoke about that we had both traveled in places where there was no access to energy, and, you know, having no light brings you to, you know, illuminate your house with kerosene or petroleum, and that creates a number of side effects, such as health-related, uh, environmentally very bad, of course, and you know a fire hazard and all of that. So we, we had this idea of um, you know focusing on well, what does it mean if you not only have light but you also harvest light, and what's the kind of potential of making people their own power station? So it goes a little bit beyond just sort of the functional solution to a challenge. And this is how the little one looks, as you, as you see on the picture. Um, so we start, started talking about aspiration and inspiration. And as we all know, the climate crisis is, is you know, very present in the sense that it's also very abstract. We have the data. We know sort of what, is, what one needs to know. But it's still very difficult to translate all what we know into all what we do. And this, of course, is a big discussion, but this idea of making energy tangible, making it you know, something that you actually have a relationship with, sort of demystify it, make it non-esoteric somehow, uh, was an ambition. And, and I thought a lot about the design, and this is why I wanted the design to reflect a kind of positive energy, something that makes you happy. So we did a number of tests in rural Africa. This was in Ethiopia and south of Addis Ababa, where we, you know, we showed people what essentially looks like a black ice hockey puck. Frederick was there, and they, it had an, sort of a, a string tied to it with nice colors. And then people said, oh, lamp is not a bad idea, but the string is really nice. And then, of course, immediately we realized, well, why don't we design it so that the lamp itself and the communication, the, send, well, the message sense, becomes about empowering. 
but not empowering in terms of uh, you know when you wear it. It's not like, oh, I don't have any power at home, and then when people see me, they go like, oh, look, this person has a lamp around the neck. This is a person who does not have power. In another, we wanted to make it so like, wow, this person is wearing like a like a piece of jewelry. This is energy. The energy is you know this future and, and and so on and so forth. So this whole idea of aspiration, or let's call it the psychology underneath this shape became very important. That's kind of how we started, uh, and obviously we were um, incredibly uh, stupid, as everybody in Davos knows, because we made very high quality and we sold it at a very low price, <laughs> which is exactly the opposite of the rest of the world, which makes very poor quality and they sell at a very high price. <laughs> and in that, and there, and there we are now. So the the model, and we have not we worked on a number of business models, and it, it seems to be that we are we are forced to have all at, at, in place at the same time, because we are now in 12 African countries. We just crossed half a million uh, produced lamps. We, we are close to s be selling the half a millionth lamp. We have been selling them for three years. Uh, one third of those are what we call on grid in the Western world, typically sold at a higher price, maybe $25, 22 euro or something like that. Uh, and the profit from that drives this as a business, not a relief, not an aid, nor a micro entrepreneuring, private sector, anything that drives local business people. And we deliver it then in Africa at cost price, which is currently, I think it's $4.85 or something like this. And that's absolutely the totally pressed down cost price still having the very high quality. And this is how we work, and we are not, you know, we, 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 are, we are very good at getting the message. We are delivering a lot of lamps. We are, you know, in Zimbabwe, it's doing really great. We have 120 employees, two of which bought a car. So, and so, so it's going quite well. Um, the, the challenge is, is, of course, like, huge. One of uh, the reasons why I'm in Davos is, of course, to talk about these challenges, uh, business challenges, um, infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa, retailers. Who are the retailers of the future? So anyway, this is it. And what everybody told me, then I'll stop my little introduction. Everybody told us, and now we are a team of 23 people uh, working in Berlin and a few hundred in Africa. They said, this is great. We love it. It feels great, too, right? It's incredible. But this is much nicer, they say. Because as we have been hearing on all, almost all the panels, the digital this revolution. This is the first I'm seeing this live. Yeah, so, because so this, we've been, this we've is not on the market. This, <laughs> this we kickstarted it last year. And right. you nobody know knows. It's just like a phony on Kickstarter. You know that's how it works, right? So then you sort of pretend that you actually have it. And we didn't. But now we bloody have it here. And what it is, is a mobile phone charger. And has a USB. And, and it works also with light, because it's going to essentially be the same people probably a little more affluent, affluent uh, ones, but what this is, is currently, and then probably in a week, somebody are beating us, but this is currently the strongest and the best and highest quality solar powered mobile phone charger, smartphones, small tablet, not full, but you know, a handful of small phones. But the point is, we are producing this at $20. So it's an incredible high quality, and finally we are seeing something where the profit margin might allow us to reach the people of Sub-Saharan Africa, bringing a more robust profit there. But this is so beautiful, Oliver. So I, w I, want, I want to say two things. One is I've been waiting, or three things. One, I've been waiting for this because I w watched the Kickstarter, and I, was, I, I, I couldn't wait to see it. And it's as beautiful as the light, so I'm happy to see that. Um, but the other is I want you to, I, and I think what you've made available to all of us uh, who have been involved in Little Sun and buying them as gifts and getting them for everyone is this idea that there are 1.6 billion people in the world who are off the grid. I think you've made that so visible and palpable to people with this project. So it's been very pedagogical as well. And then I want to ask you this. I watched a, an interview um, that you and Frederick did at MIT with all engineers in the audience. And someone asked you a question. They said, <coughs> Why do you need artists? And it wasn't a hostile question, although I have heard that happen in life, but it wasn't that. It was, we're all engineers. Why couldn't engineers have done the little sun? So I ask you as an artist, like, wh what is the art, not just the way it looks, but the motivation, or where does the artist come in to these products, you know? Well, I think as a you know, person from the cultural sector, and I, I think because I don't think it's really only artists. I think it's people who work, let's say, called 
you know, poetry, theater, music, really. I think we think in different manners, and you know, we are the people who say that creativity reaches further than efficiency. Obviously, we won't, we don't have to polarize them, but you know, we are the sort of non-McKinsian people in the world, uh, the last, the last ones probably. Um, so, so the the thing is, I think this idea that the non-quantifiable success criteria actually carries this further. It's also about believing in having an inner life, you could say. Right? So, so it's very much about saying, right there when we were out testing with that puck, and then I, I sometimes said, you know what, with a translator, right? So we are there south of Addis Ababa. I said, listen, it's actually also a work of art. And then people say, what do you mean it's a work of art? It's a work of art, I said. I'm an artist. Then I said, oh, is it like in the church? And I was like, uh, no, uh, that, uh, well, you know, that's not what I was thinking. But then I said, yes, it's like in the church. And then they said, oh, it's amazing. The, the thing is, we tend without, without thinking about it, we allow the surroundings to functionalize us, right? We always think in the efficiency, practicality, and so on. The potential, of course, lays in the unpredictable use of it. Another person said, you know, we said, oh, you can bring it to, the, to your cow in the morning when you're milking. And the person said, you know what? I've been doing that in darkness for 40 years, but now I'm so old, I have to go to the toilet on the road. I won't tell that to anybody, but I'll just tell it to you, he said. And I'm so afraid of falling, because if I break my, break my hip, my family falls apart, so that's what I'm going to use it for. And I would never have, you know, I can't tell people, oh, when you're, so, so the use is, it's about trusting people to be smart enough to make up their own life, and not selling it in a condescending, tell you what to do and who you are. So. I think that's a cultural sector asset. I think being a cultural protagonist, I also enjoy um, another element, which is maybe just worth, which is also more general. I enjoy civic trust. It's good to leave it hanging like that, right? Civic trust, what is that? <laughs> well, actually, it's good. You just helped me to go to my next question, which is about public space. and. Um, I, I want, we, ha we don't have that much time, so I think we need to start going into these other projects, Absolutely. even though I would love, I have about 50 more things I would like to talk to you about. Um, but let's, let's talk a little bit about the public sphere and what I think are, is really not just your new role in, in the civic society, but many artists are working now in public space, um, which is a much more complex way to work because it's much more unpredictable and the response of people and the audience becomes much more of a participant. So I want you to talk about these projects. I'm going to um, hope this works. OK. Yeah. So we start with the weather project. Um, and, and, and as you're talking about them, we have four that we're going to go through pretty quickly. But mm -hmm. could you talk about, I think, sort of the, um, what was somewhat exhilarating and also terrifying about doing projects on this scale? Because they're on an enormous scale. So I, mean, I think you have to describe just quickly to people. Yeah, this what is so. This is the uh, turbine hall at Tate Modern in London, some 13, 14 years ago. A big sun. It's only actually half a sun. The other half is in a mirror in the ceiling, so a very large mirror and a bit of haze or fog or you know some theater pro smoke and mirror. We call it right. So smoke and mirror. Anyway, so what what was what was difficult was I couldn't see it before the opening, except the day before, and you know I took the risk of doing a major thing which, should it not work, would have been the end of my career. Oh, you know, how, how these things are, right? You so would have that, failed big. Yeah, it would, it's <laughs> a big, that's a big statement to do, not knowing whether people, or you know, normally a painter, right, paints in the studio and says, nah, I'm not going to show that to anybody, then they throw it out. I don't have that luxury. On the other side, I am so confident that a space can host a diverse experience and still sustain a sharing or a shared experience. Of course, this is um, not a big trend in today's world that if people are disagreeing, normally that leads to, oh, well, if you don't agree, you should leave. Not just Switzerland, but like Europe and <laughs> essentially not come back. So the polarizing nature of our society doesn't really cater for a lot of um, inclusion. So one of the uh, ambitions in, with these projects that we are looking at whether they were all based on, well, how do we actually facilitate a space, semi-public in this case, uh, which 
allows people to be in conflict and still experience that conflict as an asset, right? As a potential, like you and I disagree, and we become even better friends, right? It's and like, what do you see the conflict in the piece? Well, a person said, oh, this makes me totally want to do yoga, right? I'm going <laughs> to lay down, I'm going to do my little thing, be contemplative. And the other person no, it's like apocalypse, it's the end of the world, oh, it's depressing, it's scary, I am so, you know, I, I feel, I'm full of fear. And then they go f away from there and they say, oh, wow, that was the best thing we did today. Do you see, so go into a parliament, right, and see two parties come out of the, uh, out of the sort of room at the end of the day saying, well, this was a great day. You know? yeah, so the principle is I think the cultural sector has it in it as a methodology to share or to host a conflict in a potentially um. productive way. That's why I think, I think there should be much more cultural protagonists here in this sort of, let's face it, I mean, the world is becoming very populistic, right? So what I'm talking about is the opposite of populism uh -huh. or nationalism, if you want. But the other thing is that people knew this was fake, and yet they responded to it in some way as if it were a real sun. And people are lying down, basking in this light, knowing that it's a creation. But it's not really fake. I mean, everybody, it's a fake real. But it's not everybody can sort of see it's just plastic smoke and mirror. Right. So, so it's not <laughs> fake. Would be if I pretended it was the real sun. So that's what we call, um, you know, um, capitalism, right? <laughs> so no, no, I'm not trying to I create know, an illusion, right? I'm not trying to fool people. Actually, I'm showing people. Oh, you're so bloody smart. And listen, I tell people, I trust you. And then they go, Wow, bloody hell! Somebody's trusting me. It's like so different than going into a shopping mall. But knowing, but all I was trying to say about this is this sort of phenomenon of knowing that something is inauthentic, and is, but, uh, but not having anyone hiding that fact, and yet still being able to have a really authentic experience. Yeah, that's a good is point. It's an interesting, it's an interesting yes, thing. It, okay. But the truth is, the real sun is, as we, or the, let's just say, the climate is not really, I mean, it's also kind of man-made now, right? It's the Anthropocene, the climate. The, you know, the, is the, when I was a child, the climate was sort of beyond human reach. Right. And now in my life, climate became the consequence of human. Right. And this is how it's so it is also fake. You know, there is nothing not fake. Or there is nothing real, you could say. I'm sorry, Carol. Maybe our inner something <laughs> is, is real. No, no, no I, of course, I, I just say <laughs> fake is also real. Then we have But that's the real. what I'm saying. Yeah. OK, we agree. All right. Good. Cheers. Let's move on. <laughs> to a, I, I was saying to Oliver that this next project was the hottest summer in New York ever when this project um, opened in New York. And what we would do um, was just take boat rides to go and look at these waterfalls. And it was so wonderful and spectacular. But this was one of the most I don't, amazing projects New York has seen, the scale of it. So can you describe? <laughs> So with the support is. of the mayor's office, Mayor Bloomberg, and um, his confidence that culture actually bring about aspiration in public space. And, and so I have to say that a part of that came from Public Art Fund, great group of people, mayor's office, very committed fundraising structures, and a lot of people pitching in with a lot of type of talent. So and that's really a very New York thing. It's amazing that the city, as we know, is, is, is so amazing. It was a very way. Bloomberg thing, too. Yeah. I mean. And, um, and um, essentially, to make a long story short, if you look at a waterfall, you surprisingly also see the distance that you're looking. You're not just seeing the water falling, because by looking at the speed of the water, you can tell how high it is. Do you know what I mean? So if it falls very slow, it's a big waterfall. If it falls very fast, it's very small. And so, so subconsciously, if you're in front of a landscape here in, in the Swiss Alps, and you go like, oh, I have no idea how high these mountains are. It's so surreal. I'm not from here. Don't understand it. Let's just for a moment say there's no cows and small sort of cheese huts everywhere. And you look and you go like, oh, look, there's a waterfall. And there's a tiny waterfall falling so slow. And you go, like, oh, it's really big. So there's what is called, I think, spatial synchronization with the body, or there is the embodiment of space. And this is how I work with it. How do we give public space its dimension back? Mm -hmm. Because once you have the dimension, you can actually meet people in it. If you have a fully privatized, if you don't mind, you know, representation, a rendered, a private rendered space, which means public space is just what is left over when all the private sector has eaten what they need, then you suddenly don't have any depth. 
So metaphysically speaking, right? Do you know what I mean? So, and you can't meet a person. I can't meet you, Carol, if there is no depth to the space. If you are a bloody rendering, I am not going to be going to, we're not going to become friends. So it was t about these projects. Of course, it's about nature and culture and all the city, city stuff and so on. It's also about people. Well, how and in what way do we actually get together and meet? Do we trust each other? But this was so iconic with the Brooklyn Bridge, which is such an amazing um, symbolic space in New York, especially for someone like me who actually grew up in Brooklyn. The aspiration was, can you get over the bridge in your life to Manhattan? Mm -hmm. You know, because it, uh, Brooklyn was very working class, and Manhattan was where culture and art were. So if you're someone like me, your whole life, in your mind, you were thinking, how do I get across that bridge? So the waterfall, that to, to call so much attention to it was something, yeah. something fabulous. And under the, you know, there's people under the bridge, and the underbridge is not so privileged. And there is a lot of dimensions that under the, you know, in Brooklyn, Dumbo, yeah. the, the down under the Brooklyn Bridge area. And so there's, so there's a lot of, I, I was very lucky there was a bridge above my waterfall, I could say, um, <laughs> because the bridge is so truly uh, remarkable. Um, so sort of a non-site, a forgotten area. Except for people like me, for whom it was essential. It's um, full of poetry, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. OK, so here is one of my, um, my also one of my favorite projects. It's called Ice Watch. And was this, this was the Paris one, I think? Yeah, it was just last, um, well, isn't that just about a month ago, right? A little longer, at Paris, COP21. Can you explain this, how you, how you made this even happen? So uh, when the IPCC scientists met in Copenhagen a year ago announcing the report scientific paper, I told them, listen, great paper, probably more important than, uh, or at least as important as the Bible uh, a few thousand years ago, right? So that's the kind of paper we are talking about. The only problem is nobody's going to read it. Right? It's also it's impossible to understand anyway, right, for normal people like me. So I said, why don't we translate the scientific report into actually into space so that people physically can read it? So you spend two minutes with this ice, then you read the whole paper, right? Because it's so touching, it's so amazing. This ice glacier in Greenland, Ilulisat, East Greenland, amazing glacier, the one that all the sort of politicians go to to do selfies, the selfie glacier, it's called. And and we ship that great people, Greenland. Long, to make a long story short, I called, no money, of course, I called Bloomberg again. Ah, oh, Bloomberg, you are, you are into this climate stuff, right? So, and then he said, oh, it's amazing. But also Fabius office, uh, under all the stress they went through with the terror and, and the traumatizing time, Fabius office, the foreign minister in, in, in person, he said, well, listen, with this we have to make happen. And I, it was so amazing because everybody pitched in a lot of effort to get these ice blocks Non, in, a, in a solid state to Paris from Greenland. Uh, and we worked with a sort of sustainable group in England to make sure we didn't sort of pollute uh, more than sending a school class from Paris to Greenland so, and back with plane, right? So that's the kind of uh, footprint we had. And, and it was unique because as you know, you walk up to ice and then you go, like, oh, ice, look how beautiful. Then you put your hand on it and you go, like, oh, it's really cold. And do you see how you kind of knew that, but the body somehow did not have that knowledge in it? And suddenly you connect your body with your brain. And that's what I mean. I mean, obviously that is what art essentially can do, but it's also what a, a, a sort of a report, a report can do. A lot of things we know is actually not translated into the type of knowledge that foster uh, action. We know it all, right? These, um, these are the gestures. These are symbolic gestures that I think people really respond to uh, in a sensorial way, which is another really important aspect of what artists are capable of, which is to circumvent the mind and just go right to the emotion and right to the senses. So that's why you, the, the response is so physical. There are photos of people hugging yeah. the ice. It's, it's very interesting. See, now it gets a little detail, but I think it's incredibly important, especially when there is a COP21, that we are all a little stressed, right? We're nervous. It's like, oh my God, this is so not going to work out. Everything is like, who are these people anyway, right? I mean, are we, do we trust them? Do you know, or do, and as much as we want to trust UN, it's not exactly like UN is good at translating what they're doing into things that normal people understand, right? And then you see people suddenly being, and I would say, hosted actually held by public space. So this is 
ice in public space. It's not just ice, it's Paris, it's the street, it's the time, it's the knowledge that there is a COP21. There is a room only a few kilometers away full of people trying to sort out a global agreement. And the eyes just made people so touched under these circumstances. So they went up to it. And then they were, I would call it, they were mirrored emotionally. And they just said, they, they could suddenly uh, so sort of let go. Right? They said, oh, this is verbalizing something on my behalf that I was trying to get my right. words to say, but I haven't quite sorted out how to say it. Right. right? And it's very interesting because suddenly people felt, I identify with this space. This space is me. I am Paris. But that this deep longing yes. that people have uh, for um, the natural world and also for Earth as we know it, that this uh, real fear that I think many people have of the change that's happening and that we can't, we can't stop it. Because we don't know how to deal with the fear, we kind of suppress it. We go, oh. Right. Oh. But now you give people a way to experience it without terror. Yeah, I wouldn't call uh, it trauma management, but there is a degree of that. No, I'm serious, there is something where, because what you feel is like, well, somebody saw me. I'm not alone. I'm a part of society. I actually matter. I'm gonna bloody do something. I am worth something. I'm not just some worthless little piece of something. I'm actually a global citizen. They've just given me, I have very little oh, yeah, time go left. On. No, wait. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to end with something very beautiful and very positive, which is this, the Circle Bridge. Oh, what happened? Wait. Here we go. Um, in Copenhagen, and it's really an extraordinary, an extraordinary creation. So can you talk a little so, about it and so what actually, it does for the city? Yeah, half of what I do, uh, li around half of what I do as an artist is actually with public space. I work with a lot of mayors, civic infrastructure, city planning, urban planners, and so on. And, 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 um, and it's interesting. This is the city, inner city of Copenhagen, the harbor area, uh, and a foundation that is private to collaborating with the city managed to pull a little money together to do a bridge. And it's all within a bi bigger bicycle environmental scheme of Copenhagen that the city has this green ambition. So it's amazing. I said, let's not be so functional and just get people from one side to the other. Let's slow them down and make a little friction, right? Let's not, why? I mean, they're so efficient anyway in Copenhagen. Let's, let's uh, <laughs> so this, as you can see, it's a bridge where you have to sort of, well, to a degree, pause. There's 4,000 people crossing it every day, pedestrians and bicycles, so it's very crowded. And then it also, uh, I think, allows for this imagination that Copenhagen once was full of ships. And as you can see, it sort of has this feeling that there's these sort of boats next to each other allowing you to go dry footed, like jumping from a boat to a boat. And every boat is like a little universe. That's the story behind it. But it's also an architectural sort of wonder, isn't it? Because doesn't it open? Oh, yeah. Then it uh, has a very sweet, it sort of rotates up, it pivots around the center mass there. And then the, the boat owners, you know, that's a robust community in Copenhagen. They, they get a very celebration, celebr well, maybe celebri, cele sort of brain, you know, celebrion, celebrion. Anyway, they can go in and out in a fantastic way. Um, I think we have one minute. Do we have one minute? Okay, one minute. Can you talk about the importance of beauty in the work? Because everything you make is so extraordinarily important, I think, but also really very beautiful. Well, I think we shouldn't leave beauty in the hands, or you know, um, in the hands of the. We, we need to kind of, how should I say, occupy beauty, right? We need to take it back because beauty has become commodified, you know, essentialized into some sort of um, trade phenomena. I think beauty holds the potential of bringing people together, like we talked about, allowing people to identify with a space in which they didn't feel welcome before. So beauty is something much more complex than what, what you buy in a, 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 from a supermodel in a, in a little can with a profit margin of a thousand. So, so I think the, the, the idea of beauty is for me really about people and not about objects. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you.